large staff, we can handle any species that uh, uh, is uh, in need of care. So for two weeks, we were involved with this, uh, with the fires this year, and uh, that uh, we received 77 animals uh, over the course of three weeks, uh, and it happened to be one dog, one goose, two chickens, two llamas, 14 horses, 25 cats, and then 33 koi fish as well. So we'll talk to you about that. But we're a volunteer group, so I wanted to get that point across. And uh, uh, MRC, and uh, we, we created a student vert club there. The students uh, participate, and they have a separate curriculum. So when they're graduating from the veterinary school, they have additional knowledge and skills. And we have 140 students in that program separate from uh, their regular curriculum. So they do that on a volunteer basis. And we have about now 45 that are sworn in as disaster service workers had it, having completed all the requirements in Yolo County. So our primary role is training. Uh, back a few years ago, our primary role was response, but with uh, all the great trainings that are going on, and uh, in, uh, uh, as we see John and Deb Fox are here, I took their course uh, 15 years ago, maybe? And uh, in Santa Cruz, and uh, in the veterinary profession, we deal with a lot of recumbent patients, and they deal with a lot of rescue patients. And so, I was able to learn some uh, uh, very good things from them. And uh, <clears throat> but we now are training students, so when they leave, they have the skills to go out rather than us responding. And uh, we're not a 24-hour emergency service. Students, uh, it, when you volunteer, you get somebody to cover for you. There's nobody that's going to take the tests for the students when they leave and or plug into their clinical rotation as part of their fresh professional curriculum. So we try to send them out for one day at a time and we come back and that's our that's how we participate in local responses. So we provide seminars and workshops. Uh, we do research. Uh, we do science based research. Uh, we've designed several pieces of equipment in conjunction with uh, Charlie Anderson, the Anderson Sling our general lift, and then uh, we have a new piece of uh, uh, rescue equipment that I'm gonna show you. Uh, it's a very simplified uh, horse owner equine rescue system that comes in a very small bag. So I'm gonna demonstrate that and uh, show you some slides uh, on, on, on those things. So there's often needed knowledge about burns, critical care, things like that, and everything from how long can you suspend a horse with a certain kind of lifting system, how much pressure can you put on a horse's tail. Those are the things that we can provide science-based answers to. So we can get activated by the California uh, MRC method. We can do it internally in the VMTH, Cal OES, uh, right of ways that we can get asked to uh, come uh, provide support. Uh, so here's a little brief video that uh, shows some parts of uh, what we did. Those are the student volunteers. This is the first shelter that we stopped at in Solano County. They had about 300 horses there at that time. And so a lot of the stuff we do isn't really uh, sexy, you know. It's like uh, herding up some llamas that are about to be burned up, you know. And uh, so uh, that's, uh, and then feeding some of the ones that are left behind. So a lot of real basic things. We teach the students what kind of feed they need to provide, and they provide some uh, assistance for uh, animals in the hot zone, if you will. And sometimes it's just uh, things like uh, providing water where there's no pumps uh, running at different uh, places. We brought some uh, equipment into the Atwood Ranch there, and they were providing uh, services, as you'll see. Uh, they coordinated, uh, Tom and Julie coordinated with some of our rescue efforts. This is Santa Rosa Fairgrounds and uh, Northern California equine practitioners and several ambulatory services from uh, uh, UC Davis uh, uh, helped with the housing of several hundred horses there at the fairgrounds right here. And they did a super job. So we do the initial search and rescue and then as I say, the most important thing is coordination of what animals need to be taken care of right away. And then as hospitals that are in the area get back to work and do things, uh, they get distributed some of the animals that need veterinary care. And then we don't run shelters per se. We try to stay in the veterinary arm of things. Uh, 
So on our initial visit, like in, in this particular case, and uh, as I'll mention a little bit later, this all coordinated with Sonoma County Animal Services. We meet with them and get an assignment, and that's part of our mutual aid. And they were just absolutely terrific. Brian Whipple and his group were fabulous to work with. So we go out and we're taking a look at this horse. It's got some burns around its nose, but the biggest risk for this horse is the environment it's in. All the fences are burned down and the septic tanks with the wooden tops on them have burned out. And those horses where their water is, they have to go around that and some barbed wire to get to that. So the burn on the nose isn't a big deal. And then there is uh, some husbandry things that come into mind. So the people that are left there, they're not the owners. Everybody's left. There's a couple of people kind of scouting around. And so they say, well, we don't, can't catch this one horse. Well, it's a yearling that's a weanling that's uh, probably not halter broken. And we don't need to actually put a halter on that horse. We can lead the other horse and have him follow and go to a safe location. So that was the most important thing that we did for those horses. Sometimes it's just food and water. water. Uh, uh, the culvert cat, uh, you, when we're out there doing some rescue things, uh, firefighters will say, hey, I heard a cat over here. And our guys from Animal Services know this. These cats, how long? A week, two weeks later, they're being found or longer. So uh, 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 we were out there uh, doing some other work, and the firefighter said, hey, there's a cat there. So uh, we, found, we were able to capture the cat and bring it back to Animal Services. I think that one is supposed to play. You might hit it a little bit, but it just... These are just the kind of things that happen. So the firefighter has told us about it, but he's not a real animal person, but he cares about the animals. So he doesn't have training in how to capture a cat or do things with an aggressive dog, but they care about the animals. So it's nice that we're coordinated with them. So this is the initial phase that we do. And then this cat goes to critical care, does things. But out in the field, it's food and water, recognition of the need, coordination of movement. And that's what animal service does. And we're just happy to help coordinate a little bit and be some extra resources. So the other thing that happened to us is we're out there and we're looking to see where we can uh, provide some uh, help. and. Uh, we noticed these dead fish in these ponds that were at where the house had been completely burned down. And there's some fish gasping for air behind these dead fish that we take out. So when we first got back uh, from that day there, it kind of bothered me and I went on our list server at Davis and said, hey, do, you, uh, do we have anybody here that is an uh, expert and these were koi fish? And they said, hey, yeah, by the way, the guy two offices down from you is a world authority on koi. I guess you don't talk to him very much. <laughs> it was highly embarrassing because the guy knew my name and I didn't. So Dr. Soto reintroduced himself to me and because uh, I didn't think we had too much in common being a horse guy. And uh, so he said, yeah, the, uh, we have a place that we can take care of the fish up here at the aquatic center. But he said they're going to be really difficult to transport. And uh, he said, if they're not coming up to feed and do things, they're, gonna, they're, they're really on edge. And if you've got dead ones in there, the other ones are on their way. So they're going to die if you leave them there. And I know initially, uh, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, some of them were brought back to your place, and they, they were so stressed and whatnot, they didn't make it. So we were kind of all thinking, well, maybe there's nothing you can do. But I thought, well, at Davis, you've got expertise that you don't even know about. So he said, if you can get them there. Well... Eric Davis told me about moving some koi uh, that he did uh, 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 locally. So uh, we created a uh, system and we had to capture them uh, uh, in the ponds. And so this shows a little bit about how we created this uh, system to transport the koi. We went to Home Depot with the students, then we went to Tractor Supply, got these tanks, and we got dechlorinated water at the fairgrounds. And we loaded these up in the back of the truck. And then 
we went to uh, with our animal control escort into the area. And we also went to AutoZone and got some tire inflators that plugged into the cigarette lighter, put them through the back window, cut the tube off, and aerated through the plywood on the top of the tank. So we've got a, a bunch of veterinary students there that are interested in saving lives. And this guy from the koi expert says, they may not make it. So we go through all this effort, and then we, here we are aerating them uh, in the tank. And then the students are all excited. And so part of my job is to prepare them for the worst. And I said, hey, we could pull the lid off when we get there. These could all be dead. You gotta, gotta know that. So <laughs> they weren't, they were, <laughs> they were very frisky. In fact, that one jumped out of the net. Dr. Allman caught it on the outside of the truck. So we put them in the tank and they didn't eat for about two weeks and uh, uh, they were monitored and uh, all these fish actually survived. Everyone that we brought in actually survived. And this underwater GoPro video from Dr. Allman's uh, camera showing the guys and that's the veterinary students and uh, Dr. Allman and our, some of our team members. So uh, the, uh, the, the little protocol that we have, we shared with the animal services because they said, hey, we're getting more calls about this. So he wrote this up, that's our little tire pump, that's Tom Atwood there, who we tricked into helping us without being specific about what we were going to do when we got him. So rather than saying, hey Tom, we're gonna go get some koi fish and bring them back up to Davis, we just said, okay, can we use your help? We need two tanks in the back of your truck. He said, well, okay. So anyway, uh, and he, uh, we use cattle herding principles in many of these, as you'll see here in this, uh, particular capture sequence. Uh, we had to coordinate capturing these from another pond then putting them into the tank. And you have to have separate tanks for koi because they contain, they, some uh, uh, ponds have herpes virus that they're not immune to and, uh, and would kill others. So we ended up one day having uh, four tanks uh, and uh, coordinating with our uh, uh, terrific animal service uh, guys that are there and uh, they started transporting. They got a guy from Southern California, right, Brian? He came up and he starts bringing them in. I said, how many of you got down there? He says, well, we got around 100. So people called and said, my fish are gonna die because there's no power electricity. We got soot and we got all these things. So they set up their own station down there at the uh, uh, animal services in a, in a warehouse there and did just a, a uh, terrific job of uh, taking care of this this uh, group of animals that were, you know, affected by the fire and weren't going to make it. So it was pretty exciting to do that. And then <clears throat> the way people wonder about fundraising, uh, we do it via the news and uh, social media. So I give the camera to somebody in the vet school, uh, one of the vet students. I say, take a lot of pictures with me with one of the animals. And then I give it to our social media guy. He puts it on a website. And then we have one anonymous donor, 100000 We have uh, $246,000, of which we spend a whole bunch when you're changing kitten bandages and doing critical care because we take care of whatever comes in. So that's how we do it. Actually, we just let people know where they can donate, and, uh, and they will. So uh, this is some more of the uh, kind of the fun of uh, capturing and then uh, doing a lot of the, it's really hard work to get in close to where you're going to be. So we're transporting the koi in that bucket with the dechlorinated water. And then they go into the tank uh, in the truck and then up the road to, to Davis. And, uh, uh, and uh, there you have the guys kind of swimming around in there. And uh, you got to have a rancher with you because all these straps and they had to be tied down and do all this stuff. So it was really helpful having Tom and uh, 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 support and help uh, doing things. So this is our third trip uh, with four tanks. I go in and see the students think I'm an equine guy. So all these equine associated students get in the truck. They want to go. We get there. I see Brian Whipple. I said, what could you got for me today? He goes, more koi. I got more koi today. <laughs> So we did see some horses, but it was it was really that was it was what that was the the kind of the gap at the time, and then they filled the gap themselves, and we just kind of helped out. So uh, we did the biosecurity thing; they they did the same, uh, where you disinfect the the tanks and uh, learning about that. Uh, good experience uh, for the students at the aquatic center, and uh, 
well, we got in there late at night sometimes and uh, taking care of these guys. Then, then you got to say, well, what do you do with them when you got them? Well, we returned almost all of these fish once people found another place to keep them. So this is what I'm taking them out of the tank. They go back into the, uh, the uh, tanks, uh, and that's Dr. Allman. And then we drive down to the neighborhood where we got them and then coordinate with the owners that are there, and the animal service meets us. And we trot out of the truck, carry the guy in the tank, and then put him back into their, their pond there. And so we've done that with, uh, I don't know, 30, I think every, every almost all of these are, are back. So that's been our little uh, uh, stuff that uh, we've been able to participate in here. And it trains students in leadership, community awareness, and then just making them think out of the box, use their hands, do some stuff, and work with people that, that aren't just in their group, firefighters, animal services, the public, et cetera. So I think that that's all I have for you. Thank you. Where's the boss? Let's see. Okay, Julia, tell me. Yeah, question. Um, so I was uh, fortunate to know that now that this is common in Napa, and we had some of your students here, but is it in Wizard Park? But do you know? At Vintage Farms, uh, the question is there was some uh, students at Vintage Farm. Some of our students are in the California Vet Med Association, MRC. So some went with that group, and they got permission to go for a day. And some were in our UC Davis Vert MRC. So a lot of them have connections with the doctors that are in the CVMA. So they, they work with that group, and we encourage them to do so. Yeah. No question? Becky, uh, Dr. McConico, excuse me, has a question. That was really great work. Um, as always, from your group. Can you talk about um, sharing that information nationally so the next group that has to go in and deal with koi know how to deal with koi? I mean, are you yeah. guys publishing yeah. that? I, I made a joke about it. I sent it down to Brian, and, and I just said, okay, the plywood is this size, because we're in there shopping for tanks. So we got 35-gallon tanks, we get 50. Well, 50 worked. And then uh, the aeration, so... And I said, this is going to be submitted to Nature, so don't share it with anybody. I made this joke about this scientific publication, because we all survive by publication at UC Davis. But I, I think we should put it through, because you can do this kind of uh, anywhere. And uh, our koi expert was unaware of a transport of this magnitude and the success. And he, he, he said, you can't give a koi too much oxygen. And I was thinking about that, and the other guy had told me, Get a tank, not declare any water, put a, fill it to the top, cinch it down with plywood, and then bring them back. Well, and then we had several big ones in there, and I'm a victim of, uh, I, 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 uh, actually the goldfish that I bought when I was a child are the victim. They very seldom survived hours at, at my house, you know, after I got them home. And uh, so I was a little pessimistic about it. But when he said that air thing, that's when we decided to go with the aeration. And the commercial hauling for koi things, they're giant stainless steel things. We have one up at school. And they said, you can't, we can't hold this many koi and do things. So this is something you can make and transport. You could probably do other kinds of fish as well, I guess. And they were victims. I mean, and the, you know, the... <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the one guy there that we went and uh, two of his koi had died. There was still one left. And I, the reason we pulled in there, we saw some horses. And uh, this was, uh, I, don't, I don't know the geography here, the animal services takes us around. And the, and the guy said, yeah, well, if you can take them back, you can have them, whatnot. So we, we ended up actually returning that fish and, and some others to him. And he told me, and they were uh, 85 years old. They never, they didn't evacuate a house right next door and burned down. They were just going to go with the fire. If they did, they just said, we're not getting out of there. And they were stuck there. And they said, uh, just to say, what, what kind of services do you provide? This guy, so we helped him with the fish. And they said, your horses need any hay. I have a couple of bales of hay with us in the back of the truck. He said, no, they have hay. But he said, we don't have any food. <laughs> well, we have no power electricity. So I have some vineyard out in the back. So all we have is wine. And uh, we don't have any food. 
So one of the things I do when I go somewhere on a disaster is I take a loaf of bread and a jar of peanut butter and a bunch of stuff. I said, would you like a loaf of bread? And he goes, a loaf of bread? You've got a loaf of bread, you know? I said, yeah, you can have it. Here, take it, you know? And then I said, how about some crackers? He goes, oh my God, you've got crackers, you know? And then peanut butter. So you never know what you're gonna run into uh, and how you might help a little bit. So the loaf of bread plus the koi and the, the whole thing was, it made it really fun. Any species at all? Were you able to coordinate with Fish and Wildlife um, because their salmonid rescue program? They have a huge truck that transports uh, salmonids, or are they not? Can you not use the same equipment that you use for trouts and salmonids for domestic fish? Yeah, I don't think you could. There's this big worry. Uh, when uh, you get in the fish medicine group and koi come up, this herpes virus thing that's kind of unique to that species. So uh, they told us that we were limited to their uh, truck that they had, and it was giant oxygen tanks, and it only held a few. And uh, so uh, it looked like this was, and then when we returned them, they said, I would continue to use the same system because it was effective and uh, we didn't have other resources. But this commercial fish guy, that's what he did was move fish around Southern California, right, Brian? Yeah, he moved the guy out of, he was down in Southern California, he came up with this truck that four, let's say it was about maybe 200 gallon tanks uh, on, on his truck. And what he did for a living was move fish around the state, you know, live fish from, from, the, from a fresh catch up to where somebody had purchased them. So, you know, we got a hold of him. He came up with this truck, and we loaded, I think there was there was about 110, I think, that came back to our, our location itself. And the Koi Club that came up, you know, we set up those tanks, called in a potable water tanker to come out and fill uh, the 300-gallon tanks that, that we had on site, and there were seven of them that, that we had filled all <laughs> separated out with, with each each location that the, the fish were removed from. Um, and pretty much all of those 110 fish went back home as well. So. Yeah. It was a it was a pretty pretty good success on that as a <laughs> Any other questions out there for Yeah at the end of um, of the airline that uh, kept it in there cuz I know that's very very important so Tom and I were doing the check at this one spot. We had the four tanks going, and we're double checking everything. We got duct tape on this. We got a backup, uh, you know, pump going. And then I said, well, "Let me just peek in there." And the cord that we cut off for the tire thing had curved and was pointing up. And so the fish weren't getting aerated. So uh, I didn't see. I, I I noticed that myself. And so I said, "Well, what am I going to do with that thing? Because I've got it." So. When Tom came back and he was checking the system, he noticed that there was a rock tied on the bottom of that with some duct tape because it weighted it in the in the tank, so it didn't come out. So it was uh, kind of a, I think they used a MacGyver. It was more like Rube Goldberg, you know, the uh, as they call it. So Wait, you have to be creative. One. Yeah. I got another one for that. So if you get involved in fish rescue and you are transporting fish during a mandatory evacuation on a major highway in California, you're gonna encounter major traffic jams. So be sure you have your portable charger because otherwise you're going to be off your cell phone and out of communication because the entire time you're on the road, your charger is plugged into the pump that's keeping the fish alive. And in our case, it took us what, about four hours to get from Santa Rosa Fairgrounds to UC Davis. So the whole yeah. time we finally get out, we f are finally on the road. It's our first time out in nine days and we can talk to people because we are in a place where there are cell towers, but we can't really talk because we're saving our batteries because we're keeping the fish alive. <laughs> Lessons learned. Oh yeah. And I told uh, Tom and Julie, because they've been stuck there, I said, I'll take you out to dinner in Davis. Well, by the time we got there, it was about 10 o'clock. We had fish a, and chips. It wasn't a wreck. <laughs> we, had, we had fish and chips at this place. Uh, I don't know. It, uh, it wasn't what, it just didn't it's seem right. It's a college right, town. You know? <laughs> yeah, so there's always a bright side to the uh, thing. 
But you know, uh, we, everybody works in disasters, but one of the uh, things that I like about it is it brings out the best in most people. You know, it just does. So uh, that's uh, just a great pleasure to uh, experience that cooperation with the first responders. Like, like those guys that found the cat that they're out there putting out fires all the time and then for them to help out, it's a big deal. And they're, they're, they're part of the team then. And we actually send them an email, how's the cat doing, they want to know, and things like that. Makes a difference, yeah. Have you had occasion to ass or request for a uh, response to international disasters, or are you at all available for that? No, the question is about availability and, and how far, but it, it, we, we've actually gone to several different states on mutual aid. We uh, started doing this with a lot of helicopter airlifts, so we shuttled a lot of horses out of uh, Hurricane Floyd. We're there about a week, and... Uh, and then done some stuff with the U.S. Navy in San Diego and some horses that were stranded there in the shuttle and uh, in the Sierras up about 8,000 feet trapped in some snow and things. But we haven't done international stuff. We do a lot of speaking and sharing of information. In New Zealand, Thailand, I did a training in, uh, in all those places, Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and those are all trainings. England. So we have the other thing, I, whenever you let me know when you want to do the, uh, the other. Okay, can, we, can you put that second thing up? It's called loop presentation there, and Shiloh knows where it is. You gave it to him, right? Uh-oh, I think I caught him uh, at a gap there. So uh, one of the things I just, uh, over the years, uh, had the privilege of working, at, I was friends with uh, the weld, uh, weld, only certified welder in Mendocino County, Charlie Anderson. And I told him when I got back to school, I had so many recumbent horses that weren't surviving, we need a better horse sling, because he was working on a cow lifter. And so he spent about eight, eight and a half years uh, developing, which is uh, in the sling called the Anderson sling appropriately. And then we designed this large animal lift, which is goes under a horse. And then uh, during that time came really close to using what's called a loop system, because uh, if the uh, slides come up, uh, I'll, I'll, I won't be redundant here, but we need something that is, uh, let's see, is that bag around there? I, I got a bag somewhere I set down. I think it's uh, back in there. You saw the really nice trailer extraction demo, very safe, very effective. In the world of veterinary medicine that I'm in, sometimes we got a life or death time frame thing. Thank you very much. This is Dr. Allman, who uh, you'll see uh, plenty of in this video. So uh, the big thing is access to equipment, and the second thing is the speed for, for which you can rectify that horse uh, where it's trapped, whether it's in a trailer. Because I'm telling you, the most uh, dangerous thing for a horse is their self-destruction. And when they're down with a divider over the top of them, they're beating the hell out of themselves in there. They can break a leg, they can break get a concussion, knock an eye out. Dozens of horses come into us that have been stuck in trailers and are hurt. So we have to be safe, and then is there a way that we could possibly speed anything up? So that's our goal. The other night, we have a pregnant mare coming from Petaluma with a foal stuck in her, and arrives to Davis, and the foal is gasping with his head out, one foot, leg back, it needs a cesarean section, and it's recumbent in the front of the gooseneck trailer. And we have to get that out of there fast. So we are able to, with this, take the get the horse out of the trailer in three minutes. And then that horse is in the surgery room on the table. Both those horses went home last week. And they wouldn't, I can tell you, it, yeah, it, it wouldn't have happened. Um, if we didn't have some way to do things speedily, safely, is speedily a word, uh, but uh, uh, faster. So here it is, so what, what's the need? It would really be great if we had an inexpensive, simple to use, readily accessible thing that you keep in your horse trailer that there's one in every barn. 
uh, that you could pull a horse from a down trailer, roll a down horse, drag a down horse, forward assist, I'll show you what that is, rear assist, vertical lift, and uh, if you could do all that, I can do all that with what's in this bag here. So uh, what are the situations? You could be on a trail ride and stuck in mud, go back to your trailer, have to get the horse out. You could be in a ravine or a ditch, down in a trailer, cast, unable to rise, weakness, myopathy, neurologic. So the way I look at this is you have to have these technical rescue teams and the training that John did, absolutely have to have. But I, when they do a training, what, they, what I notice is they're talking about fire prevention and everything, but they teach you how to use a fire extinguisher too because you'll be the first one there and maybe you can do something early on. So I view this bag as sort of the, you know, it's not the replacement for the, the, the team that may be needed in certain circumstances, but you may be able to do something early on that stops the thing from escalating into something bigger. So... Um, uh, let's see, no equipment. The, one of the problems is you don't have the equipment where the horse is. There's a delay in getting the equipment. There's a complexity for, of knots, poles, J-hooks, heavy straps. You need to consider the critical factor at times, at least for us in vet med. And the thrashing injury can be big. So this system is, uh, it's actually four six-foot loops that are $15 each. There's no J-hooks needed. You can do a forward assist or in about 30 seconds. Uh, you can place on a horse and, and there's no knots, which our veterinary students are not good at knots. John and Deb, you know that. I don't know. <laughs> the retention time, you know, for women, for me too. You know why the fire department is so good at it? They train. They repeat, they repeat, and they train. And we get this as a little bolus and then a few months go by. So we need a little fold-out thing and some simplified thing many times uh, initially. So I also, I, I need, is you said there's a way to go back. So could you have back one slide? Uh, the other thing is that we take some science-based evidence. So there was a publication of 7,000 horses recovered by head and tail, uh, what's called anesthesia recovery with pressure on their tail uh, equal to about 33% uh, per, of their body weight without injury. So we know that, I'll show you a little bit more, but we know that you can take two average sized people on a surface that has some skidability, if you will, and if you're using the tail, you're not gonna hurt if, you're, if it's tied properly and you don't jerk and you just keep some steady pressure. I'll show you that. So I studied this uh, about 12 years ago, and what I didn't do, what worried me is the pressure under the brachial plexus. See how this goes under the arm and there's nerves that come out there? Well, Dr. Allman figured out simply, if you stuck the horse's head through that loop and it was then under the horse's sternum and you were not lifting uh, where the brachial plexus was, which is what our large animal lift is. So I'll show you how we would do this. If you, we would go into a trailer when we make an assessment that the horse isn't capable of rolling over, we consider that our safe area. We get a lot of down horses, colic horses and stuff. We have to make decisions about entering the trailer ourselves. So we can be through a side door and you throw this loop over the one limb, it goes across the chest, and that's your, your uh, pull, that's your, the site of your major pull. You have your second little green loop here, no knot, and then you have a tail tie on the horse, and then your extraction begins right like that. You don't have to put a rear assist on, and that's how we extracted the horse out of the trailer in that situation. So it may be times that the rear assist is, is what you're gonna use, but this is another possible another way of doing it. Uh, as far as what's called the rear assist, it's that, that's how they did a nice job of getting that horse out of the trailer. But if you don't have a J-hook and all you have is this bag, you throw this loop over both those rear legs, go underneath them, and now you don't need a J-hook to drag that uh, uh, large yellow strap or whatever you have. You go between the rear legs, leaning over, put a rope or the second thing on, and now you have a rear assist that allows you to pull the horse caudally and you can put a tail assist on if you want. So that doesn't take any time at all. This is how you do the forward assist, a loop over the front leg. And I'll do a little demo if you want. The other things that uh, I've learned from the uh, foxes is that uh, rolling some of these horses that are stuck makes can make a real big difference when they've been down on one side. Well, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Well, you can put these two loops over there and you're on the safe side again and you're rolling the horse because he can't roll. He's been thrashing and 
doing things. So you can put your foot on this horse and get underneath and pull and roll, and then you can step back and drop those loops and they can't get uh, caught up in them. Uh, the other is a horizontal drag where you've got to pull the horse to safety. So you can just throw that over one leg, go underneath the horse, and you've got a uh, ability to do a horizontal drag without any knots. So uh, this shows, uh, I can't remember what it shows, so we'll have to see. So we're putting it over, oh yeah, this is how you put it over for the rolling the horse or doing the horizontal drag, you can do both those. Uh, you get a little more leverage if it's lower for the horizontal drag, which you can easily do. And then this is just uh, how we did the, the roll as we saw. So the other thing is occasionally you need not prolonged support for a horse, but to simply get it on its feet and see if it can stand or it can take a drink of water or whatnot. So this is uh, our horse at home we're uh, practicing with. That's not a mannequin. It looks exactly like one out there, but that's because this is an Atwood horse that I bought from Julian. It's been the one of the really best horses I've ever had in my life. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So if you can turn the sound up a little bit. Dr. Alderman, did you so I'm pretending I don't know anything and I'm interviewing Dr. Alderman. Where is it? Right here, huh? in this little bag. Look how light it is. Look how small it is. And Very what can practical. you do with that? You can pull a horse and rescue a horse from a horrible situation, any size, anywhere in the world, in a very easy, simple way. Fast. Must be expensive. Oh, no. <laughs> this whole kit costs less, way less than $100. Okay, you're going to show us how it works? I'm going to show you There's how There's a horse works. helping you there, right? Yes. <laughs> this is my companion and my helpers. All right. Okay. So um, here's our, vi our uh, rescue patient. This is Ali. Okay. So you're going to show us how to do a vertical lift. What do you got in there? I have these six feet loops that okay. are very light. Look how light. Yeah. They are very soft. They can't be very strong. Oh, they are very strong. They can lift up to 10,000 pounds depending how you use this loop. Okay. So it is amazing, very All right. strong and soft. So you could lift this horse right here with that? I can lift this horse like simply. So I'm going to show you. All right. So All right. We'll go to the next one. Thanks. So yeah. I'm going to do this. Oh, yeah, you're a good girl. If you ever want ranch. a good horse, go to Outwood Ranch. Right. You watch this horse and you go, geez, yeah. this is how the horse came. Yeah. No training cool. for me. Yeah. Okay. And the other thing I'm going to do, I'm going to cross. I'm going to pick up her limb. Yeah. So you would just slide this under a down slide horse. Slide down, right? Oh, and I see. I do it this way. Yeah, okay. so it goes across it here. It goes across here, and the reason for that, you don't want it to go just under the arm. No. Which you can do, but it's not ideal, because there's an important structure, brachial plexus and vasculature in this area. So you lift the horse, that most of the weight of the horse, about two-thirds of the horse's weight is in the front. So if you lift the horse only with using the arm, that's a lot of pressure for the brachial plexus. Okay. So, so that avoids like, the brachial plexus. So you got one loop on. Exactly. And now, if you see where the pressure is going yeah. to be, it's in the sternum, sternum. It's instead of the brachial plexus. So I that's the that. whole point. Allie likes that too. Okay, yes. good. So you're so going to put the other one on now? I want to leave this here. You're going to tie a now. knot in it? Yes, I'm going to tie a knot just to hold it. There's no special knot. You, you just loop this over knots. like you it's an extra piece of any other stuff? Not anything. At all. Okay. Not at all. So that's the All right, just hang there. Okay, good. All right. So then the other one. Yep. You're gonna do the same thing on the other side. Other side, all right. Super speed. Okay. This horse would put, you know, the mannequins right out yeah. of business. No, it's, it's, it's just, uh, yeah. you, you, you. It has to go in her head. Straight. Okay. And let's make sure the, yeah. the rope Whoa, is sorry. out. Oh, Ali. Oh, Ali. Oh, Ali. Okay. And then the other important thing. Oh, Ali. Oh, oh. Remember, it has to crisscross. Crisscross. So you pick the other leg up. Yeah. Right there. Okay. And you can do this on the oh, down horse by throwing oh, that over that the leg, right, so now pulling it over the top of the head. If you have a rope now, you can actually secure this a little bit better with a rope or a carabine. I want to do this. But you just tie them together, you though. Just tie them can you? together. Why not? Yeah. Okay. Here, I'll hold it up in the front. Okay. I'm going to make sure this is crisscrossed completely. Okay. We got a carabiner on there now. Yes, and there so we have two carabiners in this kit. And okay. the purpose for that is to hold this tight together here okay. so that it doesn't slide to the brachial plexus area. 
So at the end, when you lift the horse, you are using the sternum, which is a hard structure that you're not going to damage anything to lift. Okay, so I'm seeing that you've got the loops, and then you just use those loops to attach to a lifting thing, and that exactly. pulls the horse completely up, the exactly front end of that right. horse. And you don't need to know any special knot to do this. You can easily do this, and just these, these loops you're going to use actually to lift the horse. Okay, well, that's great. Now, if you put one of those on the back end of the horse, you could the lift do a complete vertical a lift. complete vertical lift. Yes. Oh, wow. All right. Okay, I'll stop. So now you're doing the back end? I'm doing the back end. Okay. So you have to put it through the limb. Okay, right? so you just pick your leg up, put it through there. You can put it there, right? Yeah. And then you're going to go all the way up. Yeah, all the way up. Okay, make sure you do this all the way. And then actually the loops that you already have for the for the front. Coming off the front, yeah. Yes, so you haven't seen the loops right there? Yeah. So you can just go around, I mean in the loop. Oh, okay. To the rear end. Make sure it doesn't slide down. Everybody see how we do that? Now, okay. Then you do the side. other side. Other side. Yeah. And if you see, you have to put the loop through the limb. Through the limb. And I'm going to go up, all yep. the way up, right? Yep. Dr. Allman's a neurologist, yeah. equine yeah. neurologist at UC Davis. He's, yeah. he's more recumbent, or they have spinal yeah. injury, encephalitis, seizures, and things than really anybody in the state. Okay. So uh, getting her opinion yeah. about uh, being able to quickly do something. We, we got loads of equipment in our place. Yeah. But we see a lot of horses be a lot better off if they got lifted oh, yeah. earlier. So you can yeah, just go coming from the front one. Uh -huh, coming from the front one. Now you have this one. So, you're just gonna so you just loop all this stuff together, and that's what it looks like. And then you can do a, a lift with a chain, a bucket loader, or what have you. So we're going to be uh, doing a few little pressure studies and a few other things. But uh, these are the, the having access to this is uh, early on, we think may have some advantages. So uh, we're looking forward to sharing that information in the, in the future. Any questions about that? So yeah. This is Deb Fox, by the way, one of the premier technical rescue trainers, along with her husband. Um, so the first question I have is with the back drag. Sorry, with the back drag. Um, I mean, we've been so careful to try to not do any harm, and but we haven't, you know, it's we had an expert come in evaluate it all. But the one question I have is that when you put that load, that thousand pound load in the back drag and um, the strap, even though it's soft, it's going in, it's narrow and it's going into that one junction between a couple of the vertebrae. Do we need to worry about that? Yeah. <clears throat> An anatomically, if you take a look at that, the, the muscle mass and everything that you have over the top of that is, is amazing. Okay. And so when we're trying to do a spinal tap or a sacroiliac injection, we have to use a six or an eight inch needle. Okay. That's how far it is. And okay. I'm back when I was a younger, I was always riding double and they say, you'll hurt the horse's kidneys. Well, when I went into vet med, the kidneys are, you know, from, from the back, they're down here. Right. You know, okay. so uh, we've so, got a lot of forgiveness in that area, even with a narrow strap. Okay. And so the muscle that's along there, maybe that's the tenderloin, I don't know. Um, would bridge over the spinal pro the spinal processes. They're not so big in that area as they are. In no, the, they're much that. lower so than the spinal process up by the, the withers. Okay, and then um, <laughs> I only have one other question. Sure. I don't know how to word this correctly. Um, let me think. Um, po politically correct. <clears throat> so when you take the loops and you do for the like what would be what we would call comparable to the vertical lift yep. tie. And you put the loops around, and then you cross them. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you feel confident doing that on Tom Atwood's favorite stallion? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The uh, <clears throat> we just tell them, you know, save any frozen semen that you have. <laughs> no, we 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 have the same exact uh, thing with the large animal lift, and that's in fact that thing is is, is maybe a quarter inch wider than these. Uh, commercial, uh, okay. these are used in, uh, in industry. 
And uh, they crisscross uh, and the testicles stay in there and the spermatic arteries and everything are not getting compressed when they do that. Okay. And we also, because it's a very good question and we're, we do not recommend, this is just to get you on your feet. Mm -hmm. Then at that point, I've actually had to maintain uh, some draft horses when I was in private practice in a rope sling. We put things like rugs and other things underneath and widen that support out. Okay. But for that initial thing where you're just trying to get out of there and get on your feet, then take some of that pressure off, I think it's quite safe. Yeah, okay. Very well, good questions. Very Jeff. exciting. Yeah. Are, are, are these commercially available? Yeah. Yeah, I've got a booth out there. No, I'm only kidding. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you, uh, these are, I went to, uh, what was it, Granger. So we went to Granger, and this is called a Tough Flex Lift All Round Sling. It's a six foot, it has the fire department like this, has a date on it, and it has the weight rating. And it tells you, because that, and, and uh, for a choker, and uh, a basket, a U-shaped basket is 10,000 pounds. Uh, for a choker, which would be, or a vertical lift is 5,300. So these things are remarkably strong and we disinfect them all the time because it's the exact same stuff as the large animal lift. So we're gonna continue to use large animal lifts, but for this trailer extraction where we gotta get a horse out of there, and I mean, we had a team, we had an anesthesia team when that horse showed up there, a surgery team to do the C-section. The anesthesia team knocked the horse out uh, a medicine team to take care of the neonatal foal and a repro team to do the manipulation. When that horse was down and stuck in the front, they were looking around for a forklift and some leg ropes. That's how the, the level of understanding, you know, it, 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 you'll, you know. So we're gonna, they finally got a little excitement about seeing that this is simplified and they're not intimidated by this other, some of this other stuff just flat ass in, intimidates them and uh, this is uh, so simple to uh, to do and then John and Deb made some really nice diagrams which we use where they're teaching because we still teach the yellow straps and the other things but it's a little you know just like today it's not a big menu you get it's a little photo okay that's the first step that's the second step we're going to do the same thing with the green stuff we do it already in a lot of our teaching though we're getting away from this word driven instructions, it's pull it out, open it up. Oh, okay, I throw this over. Because I mean, you're standing, here's the horse's head right here, and we can do it with a mannequin. You throw this over the, uh, the, the one, one leg that's up there, you just scoot it around, pull it up, put it over the horse's head, and, and, and you, 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 got what, what you can do the pull, you can do the forward assist. If you're trapped in mud, I mean, I've been in the Sierras and have friends been four hours and then somebody comes along and puts a vertical you know or a, or a, a, a forward assist on and take that horse right out of there you've seen it you know dozens of times so I went to see I what what do you do when you get a new idea is take it to somebody that you know is very critical that will tell you in a nanosecond that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen etc so I went to see Cindy Davis who will tell you <laughs> If you go having these, says, I want one of these in our barn, in our horse trailer. So anyway, so we're excited about it because our goal in, in uh, Deb and, and the other trainers and animal services, we're, we just want to help out in the simplest way we can so that early access, this is sort of the fire extinguisher when you're first there, and that's when the horses got the most strength, that's when they got the, the best chance and no, get your other resources in place, but this may this may get you out of a gym. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, if you use the same principle of the crisscross, you know, the one leg through and then under the sternum, because I studied this before when we instill we uh, when we were looking at this before we crossed over and, and uh, it's very adaptable. You can make a, a thing and, and lift a dog that's paralyzed with this, just putting there, just doing the same kind of little loop, leg through here, throw it there, over the back. So uh, the skeletal system lift is the key because the abdomen with colic and things, the chest for breathing, you use the sternum. The only animal that doesn't have a sternum, anybody know? Elephant. 
So you can't do that. So when they do the elephant lifts, they go actually under the arms. And uh, 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 so uh, I think you could do this on a llama. You could do it on a, a bovine very easily because uh, you need something, you know, that's got some strength and that uh, puts you into the position of working with the skeletal system. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what everybody wants to know, whether you've got to toss one of these when you do a real heavy prolonged lift because you can't get that knot undone. Yeah. So I plan to try to uh, take a look at that. Several people have told me that there are certain um, things that you put on there that's uh, not Vaseline-like but some other stuff that when you've got a knot that's really tight allows you to get it off. So I, that, that's a great question, and I don't know the answer to it whether how easy it is to disengage that. This will cut, if you put cutters on it, this is a whole bunch of just fibers that run in here and you can cut this, you know, and it's 15 bucks, it's not gonna break your heart, you know, when that, you get a large animal lift that's 2,500 bucks, it's not. It sounds like this concept is, is still mostly professional as well as being a homeowner version of the horse owner. Yeah. Uh, It's a horse owner, absolutely. The, fire, the person that's got the fire extinguisher that's there. Exactly right. And uh, the other thing is that we, I teach veterinary students and so does uh, several people that are here. And then I ask them to do a demo about six weeks later with some of the existing equipment we have and it's kind of disconcerting. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. So you have to get simplified and you have to be able to look because we're the YouTube, how do you do this thing? Nobody reads them in, you, you watch. And that little fold out that the foxes have made with for their, their, their straps, oh, that's where it goes. That's all you need is over the, oh, for the front leg, you go over, you, you want to do a rear assist, you go over both uh, legs, go up underneath and then around. And you can see that in, in three little pictures. So we're using an animator we're, uh, to do it and then, uh, I'm gonna, because you need that. And then the other thing we're gonna do is put a stick drive in where you can actually watch a video and do all that if you wanna do it. But if you're out there and you haven't looked at the, you know, manual, so to speak, and you're in trouble, you can pull this out and go, okay, let's put that around this way and drag this horse out of there now. Because he's beating the shit out of himself, pardon my French, and it is not, I don't have any sedation. If you put I am sedation in there, it'll be 15 minutes before that horse quits knocking himself around. And on the two lane roads in New Zealand where I spent six months doing stuff, there's a lot of turned over stuff. And what they do, they don't do it quite like this. They do the tail mainly, and I mean a lot of pressure because they have found survival is much better getting them out as soon as you can. So, but we got to understand that, figure out that not thing. But in the meantime, you know, it, and you can't have something that takes up a huge amount of space. It's got to be sitting in there and with a way that you can immediately use it by looking at a visual. Yeah. So the videos are great, say, on, on the hoof country floor and flying the animals around and everything. But if you think on a rubber crate floor or out on the dirt, Yeah. So I think that's another development because it looks very easy and oh I can do that myself, but actually it just takes so much time. Yeah, you may need uh that that's that's uh, exactly true, uh because the horse weighs more than you do. A lot more. But I in the, the circumstances that I've been in and in, in some pretty crazy ones, people show up. And if all they gotta do is pull you got you 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 can find it. So uh, a very good point, and we're going to measure the different drag. Having done it on this uh, oh, thirteen hundred pound thoroughbred mare with a with a foal in it, 
And I don't know how many people, it was dark, we had all this stuff, but I had at least two here, two here, and two there. So there's probably six people, exactly right. And that was a rubber mat. But we had the skid there, and that then when we got her on the skid, she, we just whirled her into surgery, you know, just lickety split, got her raised up. And, uh, but really good point. So no, when you come back to get this, if you're stuck off on the trail, look around for somebody, you know, big, you know. <laughs> Or make two small friends. <laughs> well, we're going to do some of those pressure tests. We actually got a little gizmo that records the digital pressure in between the rope and the, what we're pulling. So we're going to measure in different things and say, you might need two people here and two people there, you know, that kind of thing. So really good point. Thank you. That's it. Oh, yeah, sorry. For uh, just the wind, for, there's about two or three different rigging companies that you can buy all this. They have rigging books. Uh, one's local up here, Acme Rigging. Yeah. Carpenter Rigging. Uh, another one in Oakland. I mean, they can sell stuff for frames and everything. But all this, you can take the shopping list and go in and get. Yeah. And then to have the, you know, kind of the kit together where you have the pictures and then we're going to try to throw in the little stick drive that says, hey, if you're a horse owner, you know, cut back, wear around the fire, get sneak some of that stuff in, make yourself a little list, don't have, you know, have an ID. And, and then with some videos of how we're using them and whatnot. And then we, what we want to do is get Jerry Floyd back into saying, hey, I can distribute these for you with that in an affordable way, but has the all the little things together and he can buy these in mass. So I've talked to him a little bit about it because he takes care of the Anderson sling, does large ammo lift, and this would be really great addition to that, the many things that uh, he has available there. Okay, thank you.